Hi, it's Kristen here at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. I want to thank you and welcome you to our Facebook Live split screen chat here from both Dallas and the American Heart Association meeting in Anaheim, California. We're pleased to be joined by Dr. Mark Drasner as well as Dr. Sam Raza. They are two of the more than 60 cardiovascular scientists and clinicians from UT Southwestern who are at the conference. So before we get started, as usual, I want to make sure that you remember to like and share the conversation and be sure to ask questions. You know, I know they're live from a conference, but they've been really busy the past couple days and are interested in taking any questions you may have about the news that has been coming out. So, you know, let's go ahead and get started. I know, Dr. Raza, you've been going to, you've, you've been very busy there live tweeting from the conference. So, you know, what if... What have you seen that's really sparked your interest? Right, one of the uh, highlights, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. We're having a great time here in Anaheim, California. It's great to be here with Dr. Drasner and the rest of our UT Southwestern faculty and fellows. Um, so one of the highlights for me has been the presidential address by Dr. Warner, who is uh, from UT Southwestern and the president of the American Heart Association. Um, he had a great presidential address, I thought, earlier. Uh, this conference. What do you think about that, Doctor? Yeah, absolutely. First, let me uh, also uh, welcome you, uh, Kristen, and it's been uh, it's really a pleasure to be on on this. And uh, wish you were here in Anaheim. It's beautiful here, right. sunny, and we're seeing great uh, science presented and uh, seeing a lot of good old friends and and mentors and, and things like that. But uh, Dr. Warner uh, is being installed as the AHA president this year, so that's very meaningful for, of course, UT Southwestern as he is, of course, our CEO of our, our university hospitals. It's a huge honor, of course, to be recognized as the uh, AHA president. And I, too, thought his address was, was absolutely spectacular. Really, um, as we tweeted about it, it was really a personal and moving uh, address. He talked about the impact of cardiovascular disease on his family. Right. Very well. Grandfather, uh, his grandfather's passed away, and it really had an uh, important uh, uh, impact on him and got him involved in that. Part of it, though, he also talked about uh, the role UT Southwestern in his career, and he highlighted a couple of, of our really legendary mentors at UT Southwestern, Dr. Selden and Dr. Foster, both uh, chairman of medicine, at, uh, internal medicine, and highlighted their role in developing his career, which is something, of course, we're really proud of at UT Southwestern, the mentorship that we have for junior uh, uh, trainees. Right. Oh, absolutely. Because uh, UT Southwestern was highlighted in his address, pictures and old photographs of Dr. Selden and um, Dr. Foster and you know, Dr. Warner's experiences and training there. So that was great as a, as a trainee at UT Southwestern to kind of have that link at, in such a major platform and avenue such as the American Heart Association opening um, you know, remarks for the conference. That was yeah, really absolutely. special to see that. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, then he also talked about uh, the, the building of the new hospital, yes. Columbus University mm -hmm. Hospital. And he really made the point how, how the leadership team got the input of everyone, uh, nurses, physi other physicians, yeah. patients, mm -hmm. people, who, um, people who keep the facility clean, how to keep the ORs as clean as you can be. Yeah. And really use that as a, as a way to highlight the importance of teamwork in healthcare mm -hmm. and how important that is at UT Southwestern. So that was really a, a, an important point. And then, and then, of course, led to this incredible hospital that's won awards already in right. part due yeah. to this all this planning that went into it and using this teamwork to develop it. So, so that was really nice to see us highlighted on the national stage. Yeah, it was fantastic. I know that hospital is open to our patients here in Dallas, so it's really a privilege to be able to work there and also to have that um, kind of magnified to the whole world, really, in his address. That was really a highlight for us. Well, Larry, well, I had a, so Dr. Drowser, I had a, a question for you. I mean, you've obviously, I think over your career, you've been to a number of these AHA conferences and scientific sessions. I mean, how does this differ from a UT Southwestern perspective from past conferences? Seems like we have a much larger contingent than is normally there. Yeah, I think, uh, I would say we, you know, oftentimes we are well represented, but, you know, it was funny, a resident came up to me, this was his first conference, and so I was able to see it through the eyes of this resident who was the yeah. first time. Coming. And he came up to me and said, Dr. Joe, I said, wow, I didn't realize UT Southwestern is everywhere at the American Heart <laughs> Association. He had no idea that we're so busy. Right. As you mentioned, you know, we have 60 presentations. Yeah. We have wow. the president is being installed. Right. Next year's president is a former UT Southwestern faculty as well. Mm -hmm. um, the very first thing I did was a clinical cardiology uh, dinner. And uh, they give out awards, awards to yeah. young investigators, right. a so-called Lynette Young right. Investigator right. Award. Right. And one of them was a former UT Southwestern yeah. president. The winner, oh, exciting. Uh, two of the five were, yeah. were UT Southwestern former residents, yeah. uh, highlighting 
incredible talent that's coming through our institution that we get the pleasure to work with. So, so I think it's not necessarily that there's necessarily more at this time, although the presidency, of course, mm -hmm. um, but just to see how much is involved and, and, and really highlights our role there. Um, right. Another aspect, of course, is uh, this year is a little different, is the presence of circulation. Mm -hmm. because, uh, circulation, which is probably the premier cardiovascular journal in the world, yes. is now housed at UT Southwestern. Our division chief, Joe Hill, is the editor in chief. Many people in our division are on the editorial team. Yes, yes. And uh, so yesterday, uh, Circulation had a session where they highlighted um, the best uh, work that has been published in the last year in Circulation. And they really, it really highlighted for me the impact that my coworkers are having on the field of cardiology. They're setting the direction for the way cardiology is, cardiovascular medicine right. is gonna be moving in the future. Incredible, uh, important and, and powerful impact that our division has through taking control of the editorial team of circulation. Absolutely. So, and, and, and that was a real highlight actually. Yeah. That circulation symposium that we had was uh, really well attended and really highlighted the international flavor of the work mm -hmm. that we published that, to such a high quality. Lots of interesting presentations, lots of great questions yeah. from the audience as well as um, participation from the attended the session. So that was a great highlight. And really from uh, seeing all of our colleagues and you know our friends and colleagues from Southwestern who yeah. were there and present and presenting at the forefront was really special to see. Yeah, that actually, that actually, if I can hold on for a second, that brings up a really great question that came in. Somebody was wondering, you know, as a patient, how can I follow the science coming out of this conference? Yeah. That's a great, that's a great question, actually. Thank you very much for that question uh, from the, from the audience. Um, so it's great this year. What we've been doing is, as you know, UT Southwestern has a Facebook page, as you guys are watching now, but we also have a platform on um, Twitter as well. Um, so we have the handle at UTSW News where you can follow up with all the latest updates. And this year we've done something a bit different. Um, I've actually taken over control over the UT Southwestern uh, news account for the last couple of days. And I've been tweeting along um, all the latest updates from all the scientific sessions. Um, so that includes the circulation symposium, the late breaking clinical trials that have come out and some of the original research and our um, presentations that have been coming out for the, the AHA conference this year. Um, so that's been really great. So if you want to follow us, you can um, follow with the handle at UTSW News uh, for all the latest updates. And another great thing is that we've really had a great influence on the meetings. We've made over 1.5 million impressions so far uh, through all the activity and have made it into the top 10 um, influences for the meeting by both tweets and also mentions um, and impressions. So that's really special and something that we are really excited about to bring to us. And that day, uh, you know, about six months ago, Sam kind of uh, became clear to me that I should get onto Twitter thanks to Sam's <laughs> right. influence. And so it's got to be on Twitter now. And, We're and, glad and, to have Dr. Drasner on, on board. So it's and, and she, you know, Sam is one of the major influences in meetings been in the past. And so it's mm -hmm. an advantage. And then now she is, as she said, she's uh, running the UT Southwestern handle uh, for the last couple of days and really getting the message out there. Um, and, and it's a really great way to amplify the uh, message right. coming from the American Heart Association and also the role of UT Southwestern. We, we wanted people to know we are one of the leading academic medical centers right. in, the, in the country and we need to get that message out. And right. social media is giving us this amazing Absolutely. opportunity. Otherwise, that would, would not be able to do that. And, and I have to thank Sam for her role in that. And, uh, and we stay up to date and current. So it's great for our patients because we can bring what we hear in a, in a conference right back to patient care immediately. So that's a great thing. So all the doctors here are up to date, current, they're analyzing the data and then bringing that back to their clinical practice. So I think that's something that's really special about UT Southwestern as well. Also, Just, well we, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry, we had another circulation meeting and, and at that we were talking about there was a cardiology uh, trial that came out in the Lancet mm -hmm. um, and generated a huge amount of controversy. And in our meeting, we we're talking about how really the, the biggest discussion was on Twitter, and that became lit up the field right. and how much how meaningful that was. And so, again, it highlights for me the potential role of social media yeah, right. in disseminating knowledge and, and new ways for people to consume the knowledge that's being produced. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, we are getting more questions in. So we've got one here. He says, you know, I heard there was a session that talked about exercise. Is too much exercise bad for you? Maybe you want to start with that, Dr. Dresner? Thank you very much, yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and actually, uh, the circulation uh, session yesterday, that very topic came up because we published a couple of articles that addressed that, particularly looking at master athletes, endurance athletes, people who are doing very high levels of exercise. First, I want to say exercise is good for you. And if you look at the event rate, people who are doing exercise, they're lower than people who don't do exercise. So the message is not that you shouldn't exercise. You do want to exercise. 
but the real question is at the very extremes, could there be potentially too much exercise, very, very high level? And I would say these first two studies suggested perhaps a signal that there could be something in some people if they exercise to too far a degree that maybe that could have some consequences. But it's very early uh, in the field uh, to really define that. Um, again, the message is not should exercise, do not exercise, don't take it away from that. But whether very, very extreme states might have some consequences, I think that needs to be defined. And we were, they were focused on uh, master athletes and, uh, you know, myocardial fibrosis and event rates related to that. And Dr. Benjamin Levine was the primary presenter for that uh, portion of the conference. So that was uh, really special to hear. And he's one of our UT Southwestern cardiologists. Yeah, that's another great point that here we had uh, these papers published in circulation. And then a UT Southwestern faculty was the person who was chosen to discuss those papers yeah. at this Circulation. Again, highlighting the real expertise available to us in so many disciplines. Um, it's really, we're very fortunate to work in that field where we have these experts in all these different fields that we can call upon. Awesome. Yeah, well, I just, I want to take a moment just to, rem to remind people that we are split screen and that Drs. Drasner and Rauza are in California. So occasionally you'll see people walking behind you. And that's because they are at the American Heart Association scientific sessions in Anaheim. Hopefully and you don't see the cardiologist eating anything bad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so what are the, what else have you learned there this weekend? What is what are some of the other topics that are coming out? I know one thing that was really interesting, Dr. Drasner, was uh, the latest late the late breakers this morning from the yeah. prevention uh, late data. So, I think one of the ones that sticks out to me is the Fourier trial. Um, so, I don't know what, what you think about that. Yeah. So, so Fourier, as you know, was a landmark trial that looked at the use of a PCSK9 inhibitor mm -hmm. and has been uh, published and showed that it improves outcomes. Um, and today's presentation at the late break was specifically focusing on a group of patients who had, within the overall trial, the subgroup of patients who had peripheral vascular disease. Right. So rather than having blockages in their blood vessels to their heart, they have blockages in the blood vessels to their legs. And what they demonstrated is that the benefit of this therapy, this PCA, PS, PCSK9 inhibitor, also extended to patients who have blockages in their arteries, right. not only in terms of improving the outcomes in terms of heart outcomes, but also in terms of improving outcomes in terms of complications of the blockages in their legs in terms of limb loss and things like that. So, um, and that and was really special, actually. That was great because, um, as I think you're probably going to mention, um, you know, we have a background and a kind of kinship to that PCSK9 inhibitor itself. So Yeah, know, absolutely. And Southwestern is yeah. really proud of it. As, as, as probably many people know, statins really, with Brown and Goldstein really, you know, came out of UT Southwestern. Right. Perhaps many of the audience aren't yet as familiar with this new class of agencies, right. PCSK9 inhibitors. And some of the really groundbreaking work that was done was done at UT Southwestern right. with Jonathan Cohn and Helen Hobbs. And they showed in the Dallas Heart Study that patients who had genetic mutations in this protein had very, very low levels of LDL, the bad cholesterol, and had very, very low levels of heart complications after they followed up for many years. Right. And, and they didn't seem to have any other complications in their body. So really, this was kind of considered seminal work to show that this is a very viable target for drug development. And then rapidly, within a decade, now we have these therapies on the market. It's so, really amazing. so, you know, Southwestern played a role in the development of these compounds. And in today's session, extended their benefits not only to blockages in the heart, but now even it's possible that if patients have blockages in their legs, they too should be treated with this compound. So that's really right. exciting. It's really exciting. I mean, a lot of patients day to day live with a lot of leg pain and blockages in their legs that may be due to, um, you know, long-standing smoking or other risk factors. And so we actually do have these medications at UT Southwestern that we prescribe um, to, to these patients. So that's something that is available to them, and which is great. Absolutely. And part of the uh, analysis, they also showed that the patients who had blockages in their blood vessels had very high event rates. Right. So although the some people in the audience may think that, oh, if the blockages in my leg is not as bad as if I had blockages in the heart, right. In fact, that might not be true. Patients who have blockages in the leg, it's a serious problem. And yeah. you definitely should go see, you know, if you have that problem, you should seek health care and get that taken care of because it really is, it's reflecting the total burden of block, uh, atherosclerosis throughout the body. And if you have it enough in your legs that's blocking the blood supply to your legs, you mm -hmm. probably have significant uh, blockages elsewhere and you really should get that taken care of. Wow. That's a really important message. It was interesting. It's interesting to hear that UT Southwestern has this continuing thread through cardiovascular health, whether it's starting way back with, you know, statins and now it's gone all the way to PCSK9 and moving forward. Absolutely right. Yes. 
Yeah, it's really a, uh, is there, you know, it makes us proud to work at UT Delta West. Yeah, it really is. Well, that's pretty amazing. So, you know, I know a couple things. I saw a lot of things trending over the week. You know, people were talking about LVADs and heart transplants and, you know, various forms of diet. I mean, are there any new things that patients should be on, should be asking their physicians about? I think that's uh, that, absolutely. Yeah, there's lots of things coming out of this conference and um, you know, just to refresh what we know already, but one of the big things that actually I'm really looking forward to today are the uh, release of the new hypertension or blood pressure guidelines. Mm -hmm. so that's coming out at around two o'clock California time. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. We do have some information based on previous uh, data from different trials about what blood pressure target should be, but there's a little bit of uncertainty about exactly what the number should be. And so mm -hmm. we do a great job and we've got a lot of hypertension blood pressure experts at UT Southwestern, but this is going to be a great, uh, you know, session and guideline kind of changing the face of how we, we manage blood pressure. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I, think, I, think, I think it's considered, we're going to be considered one of the highlights of the sessions. We're a little before that, so all the audience will have to kind of right. keep, stay, keep, tuned. stay tuned yeah. and see what the <laughs> comes out. But um, we've been waiting many years, over yeah. 10 years, for this, this new guideline to come out. Of course, hypertension is a huge uh, burden in society causing heart attacks and leading to heart failure and things like that. And, and current therapies are not uh, our control of blood pressure. Heart, mm -hmm. American Heart Association, of course, is leading the way and trying developing efforts to improving blood pressure control uh, mm -hmm. in a meaningful way. Uh, and so we're all looking forward to these guidelines and see what the, the guideline committee has, has developed Definitely. in terms of new targets, new treatments, and things like that. Right. And one thing to mention is that we are all wearing red today. So um, this is for awareness. For women's heart disease and just heart disease awareness in general and so that's some real special aspect of the conference today so you'll notice a lot of the cardiologists wearing red for that I reason. See that. Hey I want to go back to the hypertension guidelines for a minute. I know that the new ones haven't been released but you know what are the current guidelines and you know do you see an area where they might be changed or where do you think, yeah, I think one, of the, one of the questions is going to be how low to go um, with your blood pressure. What is the target and I think Previous targets were higher than I would anticipate. I haven't seen the guidelines, but I would imagine that the guidelines are going to lower those targets based on some trials that have occurred in the interim since the last guideline version. And okay. I think probably lower than what most people were going for recently is probably going to be one of the messages of the guidelines, but but we'll see in a few hours. Yes. Okay. Okay. So what is kind of, a, like, if you were to consider a baseline, and this may not be possible, like, what would be a, a good blood pressure reading for somebody? So I think the average blood pressure that we'd be aiming for is um, anything less than 120 over 80 is kind of what we generally quote. Um, okay. Patients who are diabetic might benefit from, you know, stricter blood pressure control. Um, and then those who are older, we may be a little bit more um, kind of lenient with their control so that they don't get too many side effects of the medications or kind of get dizzy or lightheaded and have complications relating to that. Um, okay. I think it's a great question. Um, there's a lot of debate in the scientific community about exactly what that number should be, but I think most yeah. The, um, the numbers that we think about. Yeah, I, th I certainly think, you know, Sam's point about tailoring the goal for the specific patient is really right. important. And, and one of the extensions of that is kind of a shared decision making model Absolutely. between the patient yeah. and, the, and their physician. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, as you get older, you may be at more risk of complications yes. if you drop the blood pressure down. Right. Um, so that's something where I think you have to, the patient, the physician, their physician are going to have to have some dialogue yeah. about how low to go. Absolutely. Well, we do, we do have a related question. This one came in from Lori. She said, you know, are the guidelines for blood pressure changing because we are an aging population or because there is new evidence? Now, I think uh, there's been a, a number of meaningful uh, hypertension trials that have been published in, since the last guidelines. And so I would imagine that that's going to be the uh, genesis of a lot of the new recommendations that come out. It is true the population is aging, and, and if I can take that as a uh, way to uh, transition to your previous comment about heart failure, you know, as, as the population ages, heart failure is largely a disease of the elderly. Mm -hmm. There are young people who have it, but as you get older, your risk goes up. And as our overall population is aging, there is going to be an epidemic or heart failure just because we have people who are older. And yeah. one of the real questions is how can we, what, what I'll call bend the curve to try to reduce the rate of the development of, of heart failure. And right. there, I think better blood pressure control is something that is going to be uh, super important. If we're really going to, on a societal perspective, try to reduce the epidemic of heart failure, get better blood pressure control uh, of our So there, are there other things with that in mind that individuals can be doing to prevent heart failure? Short of, you know, obviously trying to keep their blood pressure under, under control. Well, Dr. Drasner is the expert on heart yeah. failure. 
direct heart failure transplant program. So I think he'd be the best person to answer oh, that you. question. Um, uh -huh. You know, I think healthy lifestyle, uh, keeping your blood pressure down, I and mean, part of one of the common causes, of course, of heart failure is when patients develop coronary disease. Mm -hmm. So if you want to prevent heart failure, then if you prevent developing coronary disease, you're going to pre reduce the incidence of developing heart failure as well. So yeah. those are things like, and I think the message about knowing your numbers, you should know, for example, your diabetes, you should know where your hemoglobin A1C is. If you have blood pressure, you should know where your blood pressure is. If you're overweight, you should know what your target BMI is. Right. Um, one, of the, one of the measures that maybe many of the people watching may not be as familiar with is something called the ejection fraction. And the ejection fraction is a, ta is a number, a measurement that you get off of a test of an echocardiogram. And like an ultrasound scan of the heart. It gives you the number of how well your heart is functioning, like the actual percentage of your heart function. How well it squeezes, yeah, and the normal heart uh, empties about 60% of what it starts with. And if that number is reduced, that puts you at increased risk of developing heart failure. And, and there are medicines that can be used to try to improve the ejection fraction. So I'm amazed, you know, even many patients who, have, who I take care of with heart failure, if I, who got referred to me, I, say, I ask them, I say, what's your ejection fraction? And, and they don't really know that. Yeah. And that is a really important number. If you, if you have heart failure or, or even if you have risk factors for heart failure, something that you might want to ask your doctor if you happen to have had an echocardiogram of all the measurements they get, you really want to know what your ejection fraction Definitely. is. Definitely. And some of this stuff is just, you know, it's, it's a lot of lifestyle and, you know, watching your diet, avoiding kind of junk food, high sodium or lots of salty foods and um, things like that. Uh, you know, Yes, and then just staying active. And so um, it's, you know, working with your doctors about, am I at my blood pressure targets? You know, is my blood pressure under good control? Do I have any, any excess weight that I'm carrying? And just simple lifestyle things that can really help to reduce the risk of heart failure and other kind of heart disease in the future. Yeah, the, the issue about the exercise that yeah. Sam brought up is, is really important. Some of the work that some of our colleagues at UT Southwestern, uh, Jared Berry and Amrish Pandey have looked at and mm -hmm. suggested that maybe the, maybe we need to do more exercise in terms of hours per week than currently is recommended. It's early, early data, but suggesting that perhaps we do need to have higher thresholds in terms of how much exercise people should be doing. Okay. That, that work is a really interesting work that, that viewers can certainly uh, access and, and, and look into. So will you be, so as these sessions continue, Sam, will you continue, or Dr. Raza, excuse me, will, will you continue tweeting about these findings that you I will. Yes, absolutely. So you can follow us at UTSW News. Um, it's been great. So definitely you're going to be tweeting about the hypertension blood pressure guidelines. And then also what's great is that, um, you know, we'll be collecting information from everyone here at the conference. And so you can see the engagement of all the cardiologists that are attending the meeting. And that's great for, I think, patients to see and also the cardiology community to really stay up to date with what's coming and what's, what is important to cardiologists to talk about here at the conference. So I think that's definitely something that is really important. Good to know. Okay, well, we've got everybody, we have about five minutes left. So if you want to get those last minute questions in, now is a good time. So then we've got to let Dr. Raza and Dr. Drasner get back to the conference. So, you know, what's what's up for the, what's happening the last day of the conference? I understand you've got some more sessions to attend. I know you're going to be part, participating in a few of them. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the advanced heart failure uh, sessions are coming up. So I'm going to be moderating a session on left ventricular assist devices, um, which are partial artificial hearts. And looking forward to seeing what the latest uh, updates are on that. Um, our colleagues, we have several of our colleagues who work in our advanced heart failure section are also moderating sessions. One on cardiac transplantation, Dr. Garg, and Dr. Thibodeau uh, moderating a session on heart failure, and Dr. Grodin. So um, some of our, our uh, advanced heart failure sessions are upcoming, and look for that information as well as we get it, and we'll be uh, putting that out on social media. Definitely. That sounds great. So it looks like, as expected, you know, the, we had, did have a couple more questions just come in during that minute. So one of them comes from Sierra, and she's asked, she's getting back to the, the high blood pressure question, and she says, why are African Americans more likely to have high blood pressure? That's a that's a really important Great question, question. and uh, you know that African Americans suffer disproportionately from hypertensive heart disease, yeah. and those mechanisms are still being uh, elucidated. No question that they uh, have higher blood pressures and also have more sequelae in terms of hypertensive heart disease. Um, that's an area that the Dallas Heart Study were particularly interested in looking into, um, and whether the I think on the broad scale the role of whether the genetic uh, backgrounds. Uh, environmental factors, some intersection of those two is are all being explored because at the end of the day, we need to do better and uh, help right. that ethnic group get better control of blood pressures and reduce the burden that they're suffering. So um, that's a, 
It's a really important question, one that we don't yet have the answer to, but is an area of active investigation. And in part, the Dallas Heart Study is, uh, was designed in part to help address that. Right, and there has been research based on kind of older data about um, you know, the types of blood pressure medicines that we should be using in African-American patients. And so there has been some attention that's been drawn to which types of medicines we should be using preferentially for um, patients you know, to in really get a ahead of the eight ball on the blood pressure. So it's definitely something that um, you know, always we can improve upon and is a great question. So thank you very much for that. Uh, but it's certainly something that we hope that as more information comes out, uh, you know, we'll be able to apply that to our patients. Um, and definitely another thing, maybe the blood pressure guidelines might mention something about that. Usually, um, you know, we try and grow on the evidence that we have. And so uh, there are some medicines that are better um, than others that, that control blood pressure more effectively. So you can talk to your doctor about that. We can, we can definitely have yeah. some input at UT Southwest. Yeah, I'll say two things. One is uh, the American Heart Association just put out a statement in the last, I believe, six months looking at cardiovascular disease in African Americans. And so that's a statement that's out there that, that, that people can look at. Um, and I think it is, is worthwhile. And the second thing I would say is that regardless of what your ethnic group is, um, know what your blood pressure is and be proactive. And if your blood pressure is too high, keep going back to your doctor until you get that blood pressure down. If it's not working in the current person, then seek another provider. Because at the end of the day, you got to get your blood pressure down. It's your health. And leaving your blood pressure too high is going to lead to a risk down in the future. No one wants to have strokes or renal failure or heart failure. And some of that is preventable just with better control of blood definitely, pressure. So, so be proactive about it and get, get your blood pressure down to an acceptable level. And that's another area where social media can help too. So there's a hashtag, know your numbers, where you can follow along, you know, blood pressure guidelines as well as, you know, data and things that people are discussing in, in the cardiology and hypertension community. So that's another great way to get patient resources and um, kind of hear about what people are talking about. So I think that was a great way to end our chat. I think we are, we're right up at the, the 30 minute mark right now. So we're gonna go ahead and call it a day. Wanted to um, say special thanks to Dr. Draz Drasner and Dr. Raza from joining us for Cal from California. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and thanks to everybody for all of the questions. It's been a really great chat. Thank thanks, you for having Christian. us, yeah. Absolutely, you guys safe travels back to Dallas. All Thank right, you. thanks so much. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.